from our books, although I'm going to read from the pages with nice big type for old I'm people. Read from this. <laughs> it's so much bigger, I can hold it up. So, and I might pop out of the text at times to give some backstory because it won't always be clear what I'm referring to. In fact, once you read the book, it might still not be clear, but we will, we will see. So, 1990. I was in preparation for upcoming European tours with Carbon. The personnel went into flux and the new touring band would include Zena Parkins, bassist Mark Sloan, David Weinstein on keyboard and sampler, and blind idiot god drummer Ted Epstein. For these tours, we would be joined by Bashir Attar, the leader of the master musicians of Chajuka. Attracted by its aura of psychedelic exoticism, I had picked up a copy of Brian Jones Presents the Pipers of Pan at Chajuka when it was first released in 1971. Immediately enthralled by its intensity and otherworldly ambience, I incorporated this village music of the Moroccan Atlas Mountains into the soundtrack of my college years. This record led me to a greater exploration of Moroccan music, including the Paul Bowles collections on folkways, as well as recordings on the Lyricord and UNESCO labels. In the early 1980s, through my friend Charity Martin, a San Franciscan budding ethnomusicologist, clarinetist, an identical twin sister of Hope. Hope was my partner at the time. I had heard tales of her travels to Chijuka and encounters with Bashir Attar, the young leader of the musicians, a multi-instrumentalist who revered Brian Jones and Jimi Hendrix. In 1988, I again heard talk of Bashir through another friend, New York photographer Sherry Nutting. She had met Bashir in Tangier through Bowles and told me that he would soon be visiting New York. They later married. When he arrived, we first met at Sherry's for dinner, a relaxed occasion with lots of wine and laughter. Bashir was not tall, but with a large aura, slim, sporting a trim mustache and fro. He was an excellent cook and made most of what we ate that evening, fish, couscous, aubergine. Next, he visited my studio just to drink coffee and listen to music. North African music, Ornette Coleman, whom Bashir had played with in Jochuka, Korean Samulnori, country blues. I played him some of what I was doing with Carbon, and we began to play together, finding our way to that outside place, sessions that led to gigs as an informal duo at CBGB's and at the Knitting Factory. Bashir taught me some of the Jochuka rhythms, which I translated to programs on a Roland TR-707 drum machine. Bashir loved the drum machine because it could relentlessly repeat a pattern without the variations spontaneously invented by human drummers, a feature that he felt was a distraction. <laughs> Philosophically speaking, I was diametrically opposed to this as I thrived on the continual elaboration of rhythm as produced by, by my many favorite drummers. But I was keen to find my way into the music of Jujuka. I wanted to hear and make the music as Bashir might, and if this meant bowing to his judgment, so be it. In 1989, the appropriately named Enemy Records asked us to make a record, which we accomplished very quickly under low budget conditions. We experimented with sounds and textures in our attempt to create a fictional locus halfway between New York and Jajuka. I made extensive use of the Ebo on guitar to create sustained textures in the makam sections of the pieces. 
a free time interval where material for later exploration in the piece is intro introduced, over which Bashir would improvise. The ebo is also used to generate a massive dark sound for solos, reminiscent of both a bowed string and the raita, the double reed horn, with the slab, which was one of my invented and self-constructed instruments. I could create sounds reminiscent of both a bass and a bandir, the Moroccan frame drum. Jane Tomkevich added some actual bandir as well. Bashir played raita, lira, a wooden flute, and the gimbri, a lute with a goatskin soundboard. With this project, he had his first experiences with overdubbing and got it immediately, building up multiple tracks of raita to recreate the sound of the larger ensemble of the village. This record was titled In New York, and though out of print for many years, it is now available again as Jajuka, New York. Bashir joined Carbon for our European tours in October and November of 1990, and again in January of 91, in which the band would build up seething intensity under Bashir's magnificent and relentless Raita solos. At the end of our Fall 90 tour, we were scheduled to fly back to New York City on Pan Am from Frankfurt just before Thanksgiving. Things were heating up in the Middle East prior to the first Gulf War. Terrorist alerts always seemed to be imminent, with security tents and paranoia the rule at airports. Arriving at the Frankfurt Flughafen, we entered the security lines at check-in, where we were separated and asked the ritual questions. It was necessary for me to supply Bashir's interrogator with our tour itineraries, posters, newspaper previews and reviews, hotel and travel receipts, and all other related documents. As he carefully perused our materials, we waited for nearly 30 minutes with no results. Our group was taking up all four of the security stations, and behind us an impatient crowd was rumbling as the flight would be departing in less than one hour, and everyone was determined to be on it. Frustrated at the inaction and getting anxious, I beckoned over two stern-looking security officers who seemed to be supervisors and asked what the problem was. After they consulted, I was told that since Bashir was an Arab, he couldn't be cleared for the flight and therefore none of us could fly. I pointed out that he was not an Arab but Maghrebi and had a Moroccan passport. Morocco was considered a friendly nation, no go. I then added that Bashir was a UA, USA resident with a green card and married to an American citizen whom I had known for years. No go. Dumbfounded, I asked if we were all expected to spend the rest of our lives in the Frankfurt airport. Shrug. I then stated that Bashir was an internationally renowned musician who had played with the Rolling Stones and, before I could finish, the security guards looked at each other and said, the Rolling Stones? Okay, you can fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, go to another section now. Okay, this is from Chapter Nine, called "Self Organizing Systems from Cyber to Punk with a Side of Blues." Now, uh, 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 this chapter starts before heading out on tour, and I realized the last segment also started with heading out on tour. That was a thing. We did a lot of that in those days. Still do, actually. But not every chapter begins with that line. Before heading back out on tour, I convened Dave Hofstra on bass and Joe Trump on drums to record a set of classic blues and two originals that would be released under the name Terraplane. After the disintegration of a three-year relationship, it was deep bombed to play instrumental versions of classics by Otis Rush, Robert Johnson, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Albert King, and more. I'd spent decades working on channeling the sound of my blues heroes through my fingers. While it's good to be able to execute anything that you're hearing, ultimately mechanics are not that important. Anyone can learn licks. The asymptotic returns. I'd rather hear and play the search than crank out a flashy lick, a worn cliche. I'd long felt <clears throat> that attempting the impossible is a lot more exciting than waltzing through gestures that are nearly automatic. With our recording, I felt we'd done a little justice to the music, and I hope to perform it live, perhaps add a vocalist or horns. Terraplane did indeed expand to encompass a wide range of soulful and talented artists, among them Eric Mingus, Tracy Morris, Lance Carter, Sam Furness, Curtis Folks, Alex Harding, Tony Lewis, Dean Bowman, Terry L. Green II, Molly King, and our most esteemed 
esteemed special guest, guitarist Hubert Sumlin. I'll never tire of listening or playing classic and country blues. The poetic and expressive lyrics delivered by voices rich and rough, embodying pain, anger, and joy, the African-derived rhythms, the vocalized guitar, the wisdom and humor. Sometimes my synesthesia takes the form of taste. I like cooking and eating good food, and when playing blues, hitting certain notes brings forth taste. Salty, sweet, sour, bitter. Tastes like life. Flash to September 2011, the master himself, Hubert Sumlin, enters Joe Martin's studio for an overdub session for our next Terraplane album, Skyroad Songs. He's carrying his oxygen tank like a guitar case. Like an astronaut, he says, chuckling slyly. It's two years since I've seen Hubert and I'm surprised by his frailty, but reassured by his strong hug and joyful demeanor. Soon we're all laughing over a story about his early days with James Cotton. He downs an espresso and fingers my white strat while we play the basic track, This House is for Sale, on which he'll overdub. Magic in that right hand, not to mention the left. Over the years, I've spent many an hour watching like a hawk, trying to figure out just how that magic is conjured. A relaxed brushing of the strings with those long digits, totally casual, but the sounds that emerge are anything but. No matter what kind of guitar he's using, and I've seen him play them all, it always sounds like Hubert. I first met Hubert in 1983 in a Chicago dive where he was alternating sets with guitar trickster Lefty Diz. The regulars were none too happy that the pool table had to be moved to accommodate the music. Hubert played Salty and Sweet, Fire and Ice. We spoke a bit about guitars, but I didn't want to bug him on his break. I was just happy to hear him play and in fact thrilled to actually exchange a few words with this man whose, man whose sound had moved me for so many years. Like so many other suburban white kids, I came to the blues through Paul Butterfield, the Yardbirds, the Stones. But once I heard the source, the real thing, I was hooked and had to dig in deeper. Howlin' Wolf's music always grabbed me, the feral gravel of that voice and the perfect foil, Hubert's acerbic guitar. On first hearing Going Down Slow, I was floored by the strange and vocal quality of the guitar leads, the aggressive angularity and the brilliance of his lines. There were no credits on the albums, and it took me until 1970 to find out this guitarist's name. Shake For Me, Killing Floor, 300 Pounds of Joy, Wang Dang Doodle, all prime example, examples of Hubert's genius. He gave each song a clear identity through a few terse licks filled with emotion, wit, and a cubist take on melody. Through vocalist Queen Esther, Terraplane was booked to back up Hubert at New York City's Knitting Factory in 1994. I was nervous. Could I ever have imagined standing on stage trading licks with one of my all-time heroes? In the dressing room, Hubert was all smiles, smiles, calling us my guys. We played some blues chestnuts and a couple of Hubert songs. The gig was a gas for all and led to my producing some sessions of Hubert's, both live and in the studio. Before a solo gig of his in a West Village club in 96, I interviewed him at a nearby pizzeria and we spoke about many things. After the show, we had an encounter with the club's owner, so typical of the music business. We had planned to record both nights of Hubert's run using the house DAT deck. The deal was that I would take the DAT tapes and give the owner identical one-to-one -one digital copies for his archives. The first night found Hubert in great form, playing some beautifully lyrical and insanely wild guitar and singing both his songs and the classics. I took the tape and ran off the one-to-one -one copy in my studio before returning to the club for the next evening's show. After Hubert's set, I brought the club owner the copy of day one and asked for the new dad to copy. No, he shot back, this one is for me. I called over Hubert's manager, Red, and explained the situation. Soon, Red and the owner were shouting at each other while Hubert and I stood back exchanging grins and eye rolls. Finally, Red pulled out his trump card. I'm Jewish too, so God will punish you if you fuck with me. End of fight, and the owner hands me the tape. Just so we oh. see it. So, um, thank you. I got one. Why don't you hold yours? So, uh, 
Elliot was reading from his book, Irrational Music. and uh, Which David published. Yeah, I'm proud to say that I'm the publisher of that book. In fact, I started this publishing company to publish this. And, and actually, the genesis of yeah, this happened of when, I was, when I was living in Berlin. I was working on a book for another publisher, and David came out to the Amer American Academy, where I had a fellowship at the time, and said, hey, have you written any books? I said, well, actually, I'm working on this thing. And I gave you a PDF of it. And you said, you know, this could be a real book with a little work. And, yeah, uh, and, and around the time I started, like, you know, I've written and edited and published many books, and I began to notice the big publishers were making the books more expensive, and the paper was getting worse. And books that I had written, like, they were, like, two or three years old, they were turning brown and yellow, and, like, <laughs> what are they doing? Why are they doing this? Like, it's not that hard to make nice books that will last, you know? Why are they, are they cheating us? And I, I was thinking, like, I can do better. I can make nice books. And, uh, well, you had and, the Estonian yeah. connection. Huh? Yeah, so knew, I knew how to print them well. Like, in Eastern Europe, you could, you could, uh, you could print them. You, you don't necessarily go to China. You could go to Eastern Europe with very w good printing, and I thought that you know if I could figure out how to sell them, then maybe it's worth doing. And Elliot's book was the first one I decided to do. And years ago, I edited things for MIT Press, and I asked them, "Would you distribute my books?" They said, "No, we're not going to do that." And then, like a month later, they called and said, "What were those books you wanted distributed?" You go, "What you're changing your mind?" Yeah, we have blank page in our catalog. What are they? It's like, well, well, you said no, 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 we're changing our minds. So sometimes no can mean yes. And so it was very nice that MIT Press is distributing these. We have like two books out now. The second one's an epic poem about Donald Trump. It's really weird cartoons. <laughs> I, I really didn't want to publish this because I just don't want to read anything about Donald Trump. Yeah. But, but at least, Evan, yeah. and, and, yeah. and Evan Eisenberg, the author of that book, The Trump Yet, was the editor of my book. And I learned an incredible amount about writing, about turning... Mm -hmm. My text, I had, I mean, I really had like 850 pages of text, which yeah, was... Volume 2 can now come out. Yeah. 3, 4, 5. Right, yeah, right. But, uh, but Evan really, both helping me develop an authorial voice mm -hmm. and how to unify... I mean, it became, a, originally it was a disparate series of essays, and he really turned it into a unified structure in the form of a memoir, and uh, that was my jumping off point. Yeah, and so that the second book, the third book is a book about music, it's about the teacher and the student, the master and student relationship. It's by a Norwegian Hardanger fiddle player. It's a violin that has extra sympathetic strings like a sitar. Benedict Maurset, she's also an ECM artist, an improviser, and she wrote this beautiful book that came out in Norwegian. And the, you know, the Norwegian one is kind of not so nice looking. <laughs> and so I said, we can do this in color and have these cool pictures. And so that's the next one coming out. And then there's a strange book by the artist Charles Lindsay, photographs and poems, very hard to explain. <laughs> and then, so that's the first year of books, and so we'll see after a year whether anyone buys these books. We'll see. And, uh, you know, my book, Nightingales in Berlin, is actually about Nightingales in Berlin. A lot of people hear the title, they're sure it's about something else. They have different ideas as to what it's about. And, um, you know, I came to Berlin for a year. It was like, one or two years before you were here, maybe one, what year were you here? 14, 15. January 15 until uh, July yeah. 16. So thir 2013 to 2014, <laughs> I came and lived here for a year. And one of the reasons I came is I had heard there were a lot of nightingales here. And uh, that I was hoping in the spring I could make music with them because I have a long history of making music with different kinds of animals, birds and whales and insects. and. And um, I wrote books about all these things. So I would play music with whales, for example, and then research everything that's been said about whales and music and try and connect the personal experience of doing something most people think is a little crazy. And then, um, and then uh, you know, sort of sh situate it in the whole history. And so then I decided, th this book originally was about different things. It was going to be about sound effects and searching for the perfect sound. And why is it that we transform sounds endlessly? Why do we take pure sounds of electric guitars and make them noisy? Why, why do we like this? And yet we don't like noise. So kind of philosophical question. But as I kept working on it, and this book also was much longer, it seemed like the idea of nightingales in Berlin made it make sense. And if you all live in Berlin. You know there are nightingales here, but most people around the world would think that doesn't make any sense. How could there be nightingales in Berlin? So, read one part that deals with this.
Are you surprised there are nightingales in Berlin? They have flown thousands of miles to get here, up from Africa, over the sea like refugees of the air. They sing from wells of silence, their voices piercing the urban noise. Each has his chosen perch to come back to every year. We know they will return, yet when they do arrive, every song still seems a wonder. This nightingale is one famous bird. Every language has something clever to say about him, trying in vain to capture a sound not made for us to understand. And yet nothing can stop us wanting to make sense of it. In some tongues, his name means a thousand voices. In others, the sound of the night. Eos, Solove, Fulemula, Orexindor, Ushag Ui, Passirilanti, Rik Mudu Lakstigala, Satakeli, Ubik, and Bulbul, beyond the more familiar Rossignol, Nachtigal, Rusignor. Some seem unparsable, strange onomatopoetics that mirror his beguile. I imagine in one of those languages the word for nightingale actually means rhythmic madman. And I keep thinking that the, the, the beats, the rhythms matter more than the tones for this avian singer. The spaces between the notes are essential for the possibility of our collaboration. The bird leaves room for his peers or anyone. He taunts us with the possibility to answer. The song of the nightingale remains uncanny. It is nature's electronic music, oscillators and tones, beats and noises that remain outside the rules of Western music, but still obviously somehow musical, if beyond our ability to say precisely why. This is a song like so much inscrutable music about rhythm bouncing off silence as the source of form. Does the bird sing hundreds of songs, or one long song composed of hundreds of similar yet somehow a little bit different phrases? Are there pieces, like concerts of Hindustani music, single giant compositions, worlds the listener and performer may enter that honestly have no beginning and no end? By joining in with this, we might come to figure this out. There was a cellist named Beatrice Harrison. She smiled when the nightingale seemed to change his music in relation to her famous phrases in her garden back in Kent in 1928. This was the world's first outdoor radio broadcast ever, with a cellist playing along with the nightingale. She herself didn't think to change her music in reaction to the bird. There are human ways to learn from nature by trusting the value of improvisation. Improvisers train for years to be ready for any musical situation, to make something that has never been heard before out of any musical encounter. The nightingale's music is accessible to humans, even though it was not evolved for us. Even Immanuel Kant was on to this. In 1790, in the Critique of Judgment, he wrote, even birdsong, which we cannot bring under any rule of music, seems to contain more freedom and hence to offer more to taste than human song, even when this human song is performed according to all the rules of the art of music. Because we tire much sooner of a human song if it is repeated often and for long periods, and yet, in this case, we probably confuse our participation in the cheerfulness of a favorite little animal with the beauty of its song. For when bird song is imitated very precisely by a human being, as is sometimes done with the nightingale's warble, it strikes our ear as quite tasteless. Somehow this passage was never uh, discussed when I was in philosophy graduate school. I don't know why we, how did we miss it? So this founder of modern philosophy worried about the art of bird song that many centuries ago? If we are to value the bird's music, we must get inside his own aesthetic sense. If we're to join in, we cannot copy him, but must learn from him while applying our own humanity to the connection. Like the nightingale, we are outliers, the extreme results of aesthetic evolution. Who needs our crazy brains, our strange survival strategies, our wholesale transformation of Earth into our weird manufactured habitat? Just as the forest does not need the nightingale with its extreme all-night song, the ocean does not need the humpback whale with 24 hours of singing. Listening to nightingales makes me want to repeat myself since their beautiful utterances are a grand mix of repetition, novelty, change, and silence. A secret code that is not a code, whose meaning is simply the performance itself. Olivier Messiaen tried to use piano emulations of the species found in a single habitat. To be ecologically honest, 
and respectful to the interrelationships of native species. Some people have slowed down ocelots to turn them into jaguars or pitch down humpback whales because their actual sound is shriller and higher than we want a whale to be. We trade on impact and stereotypes in field recording as in the rest of life. They are to be deplored much of the time, but also they're used and exploited. So we're adrift in Victoria Park with our machines and our dreams. I can go on and on about what this does to me as a lone human, off on my quixotic quest to make music live with nightingales, but I don't want to do that anymore. I'm learning to love bringing other people along with me on the journey. It's either an aha moment or a certain period of life or the, simply the sign of growing up. I'm not going to present myself as this lone musician out there with this strange quest to connect to nature. So I decided to write out some suggestions to help others join me on this pursuit. Not that I ever showed. I never gave these suggestions to anybody <coughs> before inviting them to play music with nightingales. I just wrote it down afterwards. So maybe no one has heard them until now. The 11 paths to animal music. Number one, forget the name of the bird you hear. Doesn't matter if it's a cardinal, pew, 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 or a white-throated sparrow, old Sam, Peabody, 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 or a veery, Just listen to each song as if it's a wonder you've never heard before. Two, leave mostly silence and space. Become just another nameless bird trying to fit your own music into the entire soundscape. Three, if an encounter with the bird music is not changing your own music, you have not listened long enough. Try to make something new that no one species could make alone. Four, you are not the center of the concert, just one more musician in the mix. Don't feel the need to be in charge. For thousands of years, humans have made this mistake. You can change this. Five, remember, this bird music is some of the oldest music we know. It's millions of years older than our whole species. There must be something right about it for it to have lasted this long. Six, thousands of years of people trying to make sense of what is and isn't musical in bird song have made it no less elusive. It still lies beyond our comprehension. Work with that fine, with an ineffability. Engage with the other while knowing you will never completely understand him. Seven, scientists tell us birds care only for the sounds of their own species, ignoring everyone else. That's what they see when looking at what areas light up in the brains of the birds as they hear. But as listeners, we hear otherwise. These creatures are precisely attuned to sound. All kinds of tunes around them engage, engage their attention. Eight, why do birds sing most at dawn? It happens universally, but even after thousands of years of witnessing this phenomenon, we have no idea why. We cannot ask other species to explain themselves, since it's not language that we share with birds, it's music. Music does not exist to be decoded. We and the birds exist to make it, make it together, and the whole world could feel its power and its joy. Nine, add a groove or a drone with caution. Sure, repeating grounding musical force can make any uh, flights of fancy seem logical, but you want to be leery of imposing on a phrase a meaning that might not be there. 10. Who can tell what music means anyway, if it's made by humans or birds? It's the essence of birds to sing, and we are the same. There's so much music in the world, and we cannot escape our yearning for it. We continue to listen and to love. 11. The world needs no more music. It needs no more of us, but still we keep going on, and the more we listen to everyone else out there the more we might make music as necessary as what the birds have been singing for millions of years. Yes. <laughs> I'm curious, did you have an external editor or did you edit There's your so own? There's many, you know, so many times this is, book has been read by different people. Like Evan Eisenberg, who is officially the editor of your book, is yeah. unofficially the editor of this book twice. First I gave it to him, and then the, and then the, the press, this one's published by the University of Chicago Press, and they, they like to send things out to anonymous reviewers, these university presses, and they all hated it, and they were just completely complaining. And I told the editors at the press, you're the editor, do you like it or not? And they wouldn't say anything. They wouldn't trust their own instincts, which really bothered me. And well, they like kept focus changing groups it. That 
Yeah, and they should. I would have rather had focus groups, and, and but then so it was so many times it got cut smaller and smaller, and I got, and this editor who wanted to publish the book, she really liked other things I had written. She quit to become director of another press, and then people who inherited it they didn't like it. They they have to publish this book, you know. So it really was a kind of fraught with with a lot of problems. And so I think hopefully the book is better because of all this. Like really, it's uh, it's uh, you know like you know it's, it seems sort of small and thin. Yesterday I gave a copy to Jonathan Franson. He was sitting at the Vance reading for hundreds of people, and, and he said, "Oh, this is a good length." You know, I just had to stifle laughter because he writes novels that are this thick. <laughs> well, you and know, they say brevity is the soul of wit. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, always... yeah, I think it's good to have a lot of people read your books along the way. I, music doesn't have the same kind of editing, does it? You don't have Well, it, it, certain types of music does. And, yeah. and it, so essentially, pop music is now made by committee, mm -hmm. I mean, which is pretty far away. Well, I, 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 I like to say that, first of all, Salvador, Salvador Dali mm -hmm. was asked mm -hmm. once, um, now let me, let me get this story right, mm -hmm. um, If he was a madman, he said, um, the only thing that separates me from a madman is that I am not mad. <laughs> and uh, so someone asked me once if I ever made pop music. I said, well, the only difference between my music and pop music is that my music isn't popular. <laughs> Seems like a, a reasonable paraphrase. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, now friends of mine who are, you know, pop producers who, who have worked with big name artists, say they've all become amateurs because the industry now uh, they almost do it like a, a old fashioned assembly line they have one group of people make the drum beat you know which is usually just boom yeah, boom yeah. but it takes a whole committee uh, to make this program and then they hire another group of people to write what they call the middle layer then they write someone else to do the melody hire someone else to do the melody and then the the next producer has to find a singer that sounds like the name artist, mock up the song so it sounds exactly the way it's supposed to on, on, out of their own pocket. And then if the artist approves and if the focus group in the corporation approves, then it becomes something that we see on television. Or Why do you think they do it this way? Maximize their dollars. But does it work? I, apparently it seems to. I mean, they do, they do make a lot of money. But also the machine exists to maintain that which it outputs. They don't really want to take a chance on saying, well, maybe something else. I mean, pop music used to be a spontaneous phenomenon. It was truly a music that came out of popularity. I just finished reading the biography of Sam Phillips by uh, Peter Guralnik, a really fantastic book. And for those who don't know who Sam Phillips was, he was is credited with inventing rock and roll. He recorded the early rhythm and blues and white country artists that were singing black music, Elvis Presley, a perfect example. He, the first Holland Wolf records, speaking of Hubert, were recorded by Sam Phillips, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, B.B. King. I mean, really, and that music sold huge numbers of records and it was truly popular music. But of course, you know, the industry, like any other industry, they discover a predictability and how to exploit that and then music becomes just another product, except for those of us who choose not to make music that way. Yeah, I mean, what, what is the reason so many people make music? Does everybody want to be like I think some people popular, can't help it. They, they can't help making music. Yeah. yeah, and some people can't help making popular music. I mean, I do think the best pop music is made by people who really believe in popular music. I mean, it's a song, I mean, you you know, Michael Jackson in his glory days. Or mm -hmm. Do you think, like, Nightingale music is popular music? Maybe among, among a bunch of crows. <laughs> I mean, let's go out and hear some Nightingales. It must you know, I should say also, if anyone yeah. has any questions, you know, feel free yeah. to interrupt. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do you think, I mean, you, you mentioned this about birds possibly being aware, you know, through the uh, magnetic resonance imaging of other birds' songs, but... Well, we know that, like, in most birds, that they, they have very specific song. But the song is similar. Like and the, it's functional. Like the, 
well, before that, but like mm -hmm. the chaffinch, the book fink is going, this is, this is you, you know, you hear this all the time, okay, that's, there's a lot of variations of that, but it's very specific, that kind of sound, we know the birds are attuned to that. But then a bird like the nightingale has so many songs, you know, why? The function is all the same. Or a mockingbird yeah. that can imitate, you know. Well, the mockingbird is even more, yeah, which we don't have in this continent. But, the, you know, the, the function is that you know, male birds are mostly the ones singing to attract a mate and defend a territory. Okay, so that's what it's for. But why does one bird have like one second of song and another one sings for four hours to do the same, achieve the same thing? Mm -hmm. The difference is not emphasized enough in those who study why it's happening, you know, the actual aesthetics is something that really, it really uh, intrigued Charles Darwin, it really troubled him, that aesthetics was a driving force in evolution, that we think of him believing that everything has a purpose, survival of the fittest, even the field of biology kind of pushes that side, but Darwin said, look, birds have a natural aesthetic sense, they appreciate beautiful feathers and beautiful well, and, songs. And in fact, yeah. he, he yeah. said that beauty itself is a goal in... Yeah, this but is it's very different. It's than, in the eye of the beholder. So. Well, it's in the eye. Like the nightingales need these long songs go on for hours. Yeah. The chaffinch also has a sense of beauty, but it's very specific, and that's why the bird hears that sound like "aha," this is the one I want to hear. But they also hear other sounds. They're also behaving like musicians, just listening to whatever's around. Whereas Ramones fans want their songs short. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. So you said you came to Berlin because. You knew the night, nightingales were here. Where in Berlin are the best nightingales? <laughs> Pretty much uh, in the book, there's a little map that says, you know, the thing about nightingales is the individual birds come back to the same trees every mm. year for like seven to ten years. It's about What's how long their lifespan? About, about like ten years. Mm. And so we know there's birds that we like that are interested. So it's not just places, it's individuals who go find. And they're there, like the ones from last year. You know, there's one bird next to Cafe Ahorn, Berwaldstrasse, and the bridge, you know. Yeah. And that bird's very special. This one bird, like, he, and he could, you, you get the sense, like, okay, he's ready for us. And then there's, uh, there's one um, in Victoria Park, back high up there, sort of you climb up underneath this tower. There's this bird who's picked this place where it sort of echoes. That's a good one. And we found one cl very close to the Brandenburg Gate and this sort of weird statue of a woman on a horse. And this bird is... Uh, also kind of into these activities, does, doesn't fly away, but if you, and you can find them during the day, they don't sing as much, but they're in the same places. This one bird refuses to be photographed and just hides. <laughs> and, and each one has, does different things, and then there's, in most places all over the city, even where there aren't parks, where there's, they, there's so many of them. And the question is, when do they sing? Now it's a little late. They've now sort of made it and settled. They sing more in the afternoon to evening, a less intense song. So the last few days I've heard them in the afternoon and the evening and they're not singing at midnight anymore. And so, so you can, uh, you know, the, the map shows a few of the ones we liked. In Hasenheide, there are these birds that are really happy when the, the carnival dies down at 11 p.m. They feel like they've won and they really start to sing. <laughs> but this carnival gets bigger and bigger every year and longer and longer. But they still do tend to shut down at 11 and the birds start to sing. So. So there's one in the Trep Tower Park. The Trep Tower Park's where the scientists from the Free University have been studying nightingale song. They know they know each bird. They've coded them. They know secret things about them. And they got what we ran into them once in the beginning of the book, and they get very upset. Like you you're ruining our birds. You're like remixing them on your iPad. You've ruined this bird for us. He's not. I said. What do you mean? Like this bird hearing like parties all night, all kinds of sounds. And, like this is the noisiest place. What do you mean, ruining the bird by, you, you know? And that's a whole interesting trajectory <coughs> that goes on. So you, I, I think you can find them everywhere. Many people will tell you their favorite birds and where they are, and have an intimate relationship with, with the, the nightingales near where they live. Yeah. How do you go about improvising to, to the bird songs? Good question. I think, you know, to, to do it well, you, you kind of. Uh, I mean, the nightingale has this remarkable quality to his songs that he leaves space. One phrase, boop, 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 and then waits. Boop, 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 ch -ch 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 and leaves space in between. So he's asking for you to fill in the yeah. spaces. And, and when, the, 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 when the males first arrive, each one is singing, they tend to interrupt each other. When they've established their territories, 
one sings and leaves space for someone else back and forth. And then a certain kind of bird just kind of ignores everyone else and just is singing all the time. And then this is in a science paper. It describes the three kinds of nightingale responses. And I said, boy, that's just like the three kinds of jazz musicians you might meet. <laughs> Play with someone you don't know. Someone's like constantly interrupting. Someone else like, okay, back and forth. And then there's someone who's just like, oh, were you playing? I didn't notice because it wasn't my solo. <laughs> well, well, you know, the thing yeah. is that any kind of improvising, you're taking in what's going around you and finding a way to react, whether, I mean, imitation and transformation is usually the most basic form of improvising. And then th some people make a strategy of uh, creating contrast or creating textures against someone else's melody or creating rhythms against. So it's, it's a, a lot of it is strategy, but it's not necessarily conscious strategy. I think a lot of it, you operate on automatic just from having done it. Most of the people that we all improvise with have made it a general practice. And so there's, there's something that I call the accountant in operating when I'm improvising. Usually, I mean, if it's going well, you're just lost in the music and there's an inevitability about it. You feel as if the music is playing you and in, in its ideal state. But at the same time, there is this little voice that says, well, it sounds like the battery's getting a weak and your, your A string needs to be you know, tuned up about a quarter tone and you know, now pick up this thing and now put down this thing. And, you know, that's all part of the process. But, it's, but it's, you know, like, it doesn't necessarily interfere with that continuity that you're part of as an improviser. There's also the notion of improvisation versus composition. I always like to say that as an improviser, you should feel as if you're creating a piece that has the inevitability of a good composition. And just as a composer, you want to create something that has an arc that has the unpredictability and spontaneity of a good improvisation. You know, let yourself be surprised. And, and the act of writing, you find yourself going into realms that you didn't expect to when you started working on a piece, ideally, that is. Is there an animal that you would play with? That I would play with? Yeah, have you? Uh, I have, I have. I mean, in back when I was in university in 1973, a dancer I was working with was working with <laughs> whales, with humpback whales, and she had recordings of them, and I was playing bass clarinet, and that was actually quite a good match. I had a dog at the time who really hated when I played alto saxophone and she would <laughs> sing along and she also hated trombone. Roswell Rudd, the great uh, jazz composer and improviser, was my teacher at Bard College and she hated when Roswell would play and so they would get into these barking and growling matches, you know, and, and she wasn't, and she, you, you could see that she was visibly disturbed but at the same time when it was over she would wag her tail, and it was, so maybe it was uh, her own form of So when know, the communication. dog joined in, it meant she was disturbed yeah. rather than enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She, but she couldn't contain herself. Oh, I see. That's interesting. She had to, she had to react. She had if to I was react. playing alto or if Roswell was mm -hmm. playing trombone. There was no escape. Roswell would, would not tell me to leave her, to, to not bring her to class, though. He right. didn't mind. He, was, he didn't mind. He was Did he cool. want her in class? Hard to say. Roswell. Did he shout at all the students to say, this dog is a better, <laughs> paying better attention than all of you? Yeah, right. David, did, did you improvise real, in real time with the nightingale? Yeah, that's what the whole thing is about. It's all about playing live with the birds. Live, live. And not we not did it right really, here. Ah, okay. We didn't do it here because, you know, it's late for them singing, but we, we spent a lot of time in Victoria Park. And, and all these places that we're talking about. It's, it's, all, it's all about the live experience. And, and a lot of the book is about bringing other people out there and watching their music change. And we made a film about this because it's so interesting to film what happens when people do this for the first time. We've shown it three times so far and then we're gonna send it around. And, and it was really interesting to see it all transformed into like this live story. And in my uh, experience, um, I have a studio on the countryside and I can open my windows, my back large windows, mm -hmm. and then I, when I play, play piano, yeah. then the, the birds start. Mm. And they, they, they wait, uh, but I don't know whether, um, I'm not sure whether they react or I'm reacting, and, but, but there is, is some of impulses which are coming together. This is very interesting about 
half an hour. And uh, before I play piano, it's silence. Mm -hmm. When I start the piano, then the words start. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, you know, and this brings up something that's in the book. I talk about the difference between science and art, and their criteria for truth. Like as a musician, I can I can go p play hours and hours of live performances, different people together with nightingales, yeah. and I can just have one moment where it really seems to make sense. I listen to it, I look at the film of it. Boy, this is really something interesting is happening here, and it's between humans and birds. But if I was a scientist, I want to I want to a answer the question: Are the birds reacting? I would have to do it thousands of times, collect data and score the results, have the pure song before and after, a huge amount of statistical analysis before I could say anything. That's the nature of this kind of knowledge. And only then, as a scientist, could I say yes or no. Yeah. But and, so, and, so, they might, and they might not even have an answer because there's right. so many variables. That's what's in the, what happens in the analyzing. book. I talk about my friend Tina Roske, who's a, she, she actually works at a place with the improbable name of not so... You, Let's see how many of you have heard of this. The Max Planck Institute of Empirical Aesthetics. Can you believe such a place exists? And yes, there's one person there studying the aesthetics of Nightingale songs. Everyone else is studying children and adults and human brains and, and also analyzing, like reading poetry, what it does to you. That's a very funny part of the work. There. I was there the other day. And so, you know, Tina is in the film and in the book and she felt like... I, she got more interested in analyzing Nightingale songs, the less she was sure about anything. She, she, said, she feels like as a scientist, she got transfixed by the beauty of the song. Mm -hmm. It sent her in a direction of confusion. But then the, there's one thing she ended up being able to conclude, one really interesting scientific conclusion, which you're going to have to read the book to find out. I'm not going to tell you. So, so we it, have to. Yeah, yeah. But we know what's interesting about any analyzing any performance situation, whether it's interspecies or just a solo person. You have an experience playing a concert. Maybe you play the music by yourself alone in a studio or a room. Maybe you have it with an audience and it feels a certain way. And that moment creates a perceptual framing that is not necessarily the same the next time you hear the music. I've done concerts where I felt I was playing brilliantly and the audience loved it and I listened to a recording six months later, it's absolutely terrible. And concerts where I felt that I was struggling to get every note out, every sound, and the audience likewise disliked it as much as I was disliking doing it. And then I listened to the recording, I said, well now this was actually a really great concert, you know. But even then, can, I, can one ever be objective about this analysis? You know, the thing about a, a, a concert is it's larger than just the intrinsic value of the sounds being made. It's, I, I think there's this pheromonal communication that happens, that, and if there's a certain amount of agreement, I, I would call it handshaking, then people share that experience of it being positive or negative or whatever. And it exists outside of what the sound itself is. Yeah, we have this, uh, there's a lot of versions of the music from this project. Like a, you can listen online to like a one hour version called Nightingales in Berlin. And we have this double CD version. They're, they're Nightingale cities. One city is Helsinki, the other is Berlin. And one of the tracks in Helsinki, we have this problem that it's dark all the time. I'm sorry, it's light all the time. The Nightingales don't like that. They want to be in the dark. And they move constantly at night. It really bothers them. They're kind of pissed off. They're waiting for it to get dark. But one moment, we've been up like six nights in a row doing this. And when it's light all the time, it messes up the time. Like the nighty girls would sing from 10 p.m. to midnight. And then from 2 to 3.30 a.m. By 4, it's already too light. And, and then uh, this one time, I was so fed up with the whole process. It seemed totally ridiculous. I was just playing. You know, I said, this is just worthless. I can't do it anymore. And that's my favorite recording of all of them. It was the best, but at the time I thought it was the worst. It made absolutely no sense. Do they migrate? So That's the whole migrate? thing, yeah, they go to Africa. Well, have you ever recorded with them down there? I haven't been there. I mean, in winter, most of these songbirds don't sing much. They're singing okay. in, in spring. Yeah, yeah. And there's, there's right. one songbird in Europe, the Sumpfrosanger, the European marsh warbler, that learns African bird songs and comes back and sings them. It's the only bird we know that does anything like that. He likes it, like an audio version of like you know, you know, Instagram or something like, hey, I learned this, I learned this, hey. You know. It's unclear who's paying attention to all this, but they do it. Ethnomusicologist. Right. One person. 
Actually, it was a teenage girl who discovered this. She said, this sounds like an African bird song. I've been listening to these cassette tapes in the 1970s. And then the ornithologist said, no, don't be silly, little girl. Like, Birds don't do that. They don't copy bird songs from Africa. She says, I think they do. And then she went to like college and then <laughs> graduate school and wrote this 100-page dissertation on this. <laughs> Nobody said anything. No one disputed it. It's like, OK. <laughs> academic seal of approval. They're just not sure what to make of it. It's so against everything else that ornithology is saying about what birds do. But they, they didn't say it's wrong. Well, everything is correct until it's proven or incorrect until it's proven otherwise. <laughs> That's right. You know, and there's so much we don't know. Every species has its own aesthetic sense. It's like a world unto itself. And we, we've only bothered to pay close attention to so few. Mm -hmm. and there's uh, so much. So, yeah. so how often uh, do the birds get the noise disease? Uh, when a nightingale is singing at night, nothing will make him stop. Yeah. Once he starts, like around midnight, he's going to go on for hours and hours. If they're competing with us, they're going to win. Because we're not going to want to sing as long as they do. If they're trying things out and making music and listening, then they might be disappointed when they leave, when we leave. And so, um, th you know, we, you can play a loud electric guitar next to this bird. It can be like as far away as you. And it's just not going to stop. They just keep going. During the day, you can make them fly away. They're more, more skittish. But at night, they're, they're holding their ground. They're just going to be there. And I, I think, you know, but many people feel that they must like being in a world full of sound. Like in this. They're not in the quiet places, necessarily. Some of them just pick noisy places. Mm -hmm. You know, famously in Alt Treptow, at the junction of the main traffic light there, this, for years, a nightingale would just sit on top of the light, singing in the noisiest place in that part of town. And it's totally quiet, like 50 meters away. We wouldn't go there. This is where I'm going to be. So tough. self-promotion, I have a sound installation made from bird sounds at the Jeff Stern Sonic Space opening tomorrow night. It's on Bergmannstrasse number 59, I believe, down in, uh, what is it, near the uh, Jakobskirche? It's down in the uh, southern part of Kreuzberg. It's right near here. Yeah, not far. Yeah. And then on Saturday night, a concert uh, improvisations with Magda Mayas, the pianist, and Hillary Jeffrey, the trombonist at KM28, Where's starting that? at 8 o'clock. I think it's also in Kreuzberg. I'm not sure. In the Karl Marx Platz. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. 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 And so we have yeah. books to sign if anyone wants and CDs mm -hmm. to listen to. And if you to want to read this in German, it'll come out next May. And we're going to do many more events. Maybe one here, a whole big, uh, you know. We can bring Nightingale scientists and uh, musicians together. And, and uh, it should be noted that among individual nightingales, some of them are more composers. They have one order of songs they always sing. Others are more improvisers. <laughs> always doing different things. And we do not know why. Is there an age? Have, is there any way to measure? Yeah, you can, you can measure which age? one's following the same pattern all the yeah. time. But we don't know what it implies about it. So what do you say playing with the nightingales changed you? Play? Of course. Yeah, and this one track that I said, uh, you know, I started to, to, in all of these projects, I started to think a different kind of sound was musical than previously, I thought. A different sense of rhythm. Like a lot of scientists are obsessed with the fact that, you know, animals have a hard time following a beat, whether they're chimpanzees or, you know, nightingales. But why would you want to do that? Like, like there's, nightingale's so rhythmic, he's going, doo -doo 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 -doo, and he waits, and then, boo, 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 ch -ch -ch. It's a very interesting rhythmic strategy going on and on through the night. You spend time with that, it changes your sense of what yeah. music can be. The sense of similarity and difference between one phrase and another. It's kind of, mostly the sense of getting this idea of rhythm that starts and stops like that. Mm -hmm. And you just hear it for hours and hours, you realize that it is a whole aesthetic thing on, mm -hmm. on its own. So yes, it certainly. Mm -hmm. I think it should, that you're playing in with a new situation to change your sense of it could be.
Thanks a lot.